Invincible is a 144-issue comic book series from author Robert Kirkman of The Walking Dead fame, recently adapted into an 8-40-minute episode season for Amazon Prime. The cartoon makes a lot of changes to the source material, reorganizing events and emphasis on certain characters, and so I will be taking the show on its own merits in this analytical rundown and ignoring the additional context which the comics might have provided, as they are ultimately fundamentally different products. I would encourage anyone invested in the cartoon series to experience the comics as well for this reason, but this is not a video convincing you to consume either of those. If you like violent superhero shows, you will like Invincible, so you might as well watch it first if you don't want any spoilers. I will be sharing spoilers for the series flippantly in this video because, frankly, I found out about the show through the climactic battle becoming a huge internet meme and was more interested in it knowing where it would end up than I probably would have been otherwise. Invincible's Omni-Man is basically Superman, but if instead of growing up as an Earthling, he had been a Kryptonian warrior for like 500 years and was begrudgingly putting on a human face since coming to Earth so that he could fit in long enough to raise a progeny. Viltrumites are a little bit more like the Saiyans from Dragon Ball Z, though, in that they are a proud warrior race who weed out their weak and conquer galaxies. His son, the titular Invincible, deals with similar issues to Spider-Man in the PS4 Insomniac game of failing to keep up with a relationship, a life of crime fighting, and the expectations of his secretly evil parental figure. But he's closer in attitude and stage of life to Gohan during Dragon Ball Z's Great Saiyaman arc, balancing high school, trying to hide his secret identity from his girlfriend, saving the world, and dealing with regular street-level crime. So many close calls. I need a way to use my powers without letting all of my classmates know. Many people have compared the show to Dragon Ball Z if Gohan's dad had been Vegeta. Unlike any of those stories that Invincible builds off of, though, it is extremely dark and insanely violent. Because the main character, Mark, is in fact invincible, as far as we can tell, and boy do we see that put to the test in the show, what's at stake is not his body, but his conscience. It's not necessarily that any of what happens here has never been touched on in comics when they lean on their darker themes, but the over-the-top and detailed gore is effective in eliciting a just right amount of discomfort to traumatize the audience along with the characters. That extra edge gives it deconstructive moments of realism, which reminded me of the excellent webcomic Strong Female Protagonist, which leans in on the farther-reaching realistic consequences of common comic book tropes to tinge them with an extra shade of darkness. For anyone that hated the unacknowledged massive human toll of the fight at the end of Man of Steel, the final battle of this season makes good on the concept and turns the classic Spider-Man saving a train scene on its head in unbelievable fashion. The allowance for psychopathic brutality on the part of Omni-Man is certainly what makes him an unforgettable villain. While the other members of his superhero team might have been killed a little prematurely in the cartoon for them to stick out as characters, the fact that they look so much like the real Justice League just getting grotesquely curb stomped by what at first deliberately comes off as off-brand Superman bleaches the memories of that awful fight among the team in the Justice League movies right out of your memory. The best stuff in the cartoon revolves around Omni-Man's wife Debbie and the Global Defense Agency had Cecil dealing with the realization that the superhero they've trusted and worked with all this time is actually a two-faced psycho, barely capable of pretending to care about them after he stops thinking he has to. Mark, who has been raised under people going out of their way to be performatively normal and good-natured his whole life, isn't expecting the suddenly abusive tough love and heavy expectations his father suddenly presses on him as soon as he finally develops superpowers. But considering the actually hellish nature of hero work, Omni-Man isn't totally wrong to have and encourage a jaded and also no-nonsense attitude toward it, which Mark quickly realizes and starts trying to deal with. It is only because he puts himself through so much in the name of being like his dad that Mark is able to bear with his betrayal of humanity and to fight back both physically and emotionally until his father backs off for fear of destroying the only thing that actually does matter to him. Where the Invincible cartoon falters is mostly in how much it races through some of the plot and character development in the name of succinctly focusing on and completing a few heavily rearranged narrative arcs within the span of about 700 minutes. While the sub-arc of Mark's hero friend Adam Eve emancipating herself from a conservative household and cheating asshole but in the end surprisingly fleshed out boyfriend Rex is all fine, it doesn't build to anything substantial by season's end, leaving me hungry to see these characters undergo more substantial development. The one minor character with a satisfying arc in the season is Robot, whose almost creepy stalkerish devotion to rescuing his crush Monster Girl leads him into working with the delightful supervillain mad scientist duo Mahler and his inferior class. 
clone. The idea that both are always made to think they are original leads to great dialogue, and their chemistry as loose and narcissistic scientists in contests with the serious and self-sacrificing genius robot leads to the most fun and clever interactions in the show. Nevertheless, while Monster Girl has her moments and cutely reciprocates Robot's affections in the end, I might have forgotten about the rest of the new Guardians of the Globe if Duplicate's power didn't exist so she could be gorily exploded multiple times in every battle. Subplots introducing reoccurring villains such as Titan or D.A. Sinclair rush to conclusion a little too quickly. Titan's arc does work because of the ending twist and the consequential total beatdown that is the battle right beforehand, but the arc of Rick getting kidnapped and turned into a cyborg because of Mark being too caught up in his own relationship issues kind of gets blown by as just another of the reasons Mark isn't very good at prioritizing his time. The arc of the Guardians learning to become a team has a payoff, but it isn't really earned. They all just sort of come together by the end without really having a deep moment together as a team. Again, I barely know who a couple of them are. Damien Darkblood the Demon Detective seems like a decently cool character and is ultimately the reason Debbie is able to confirm Omni-Man is a murderer, but he doesn't really get developed or accomplished much beyond jobbing for the reveal that Cecil already knows who Omni-Man is and wants to keep it secret until he thinks he can kill him. By far the most wasted character in the show, though, is Mark's girlfriend Amber, which is particularly unfortunate because she actually receives a lot of focus. Amber is a good Samaritan and kind of a vicious talker who catches Mark's attention towards the start of the show and enters a relationship with him by episode 2. In episode 3, Mark has to abandon one of their dates to go fight a supervillain, which makes Amber upset, but she decides to stick it out because he seems like a decent guy. This conflict reaches what ought to be its logical conclusion in the next episode, when Mark is tasked to fly to Mars to supervise mankind's first mission there, abandoning his girlfriend for over two weeks and coming back with a rock that he can't explain as a souvenir. This moment essentially marks the breaking point in their relationship and the conflict that will define it from this point forward. And like a real life dragged out relationship, it is painful to have to listen to again and again. We never see Amber and Mark really having fun, supporting each other, or doing anything which would make us want them to stay together from this point forward. It's pretty much always the same fight about Mark's inability to tell the truth or manage his time correctly. The entire conflict becomes particularly egregious when we learn that Amber has already figured out that Mark is invincible three weeks prior and chosen not to address it. Ugh, I know you're a superhero. Because regardless of whether she was going to forgive him or approve of what he's been up to, the way she continues pretending that she doesn't understand why he is the way he is makes her deeply unsympathetic for her own participation in the relationship. All in all, the melodrama between these two became repetitive and obnoxious to watch and didn't really have an emotional payoff by the end of the season. Omni-Man's betrayal is such a cataclysmic event that it basically wipes the slate clean on the character's emotions by season's end, which I know does not reflect the structure of the comics or where the story of these relationships will go therein, but again, enough is already different to consider this a separate product. Taken on its own merits, I think Invincible is a solid cartoon. The action scenes are well directed, and the gore is viscerally detailed, even if the animation can be simplistically limited or awkward kind of frequently. By far my biggest complaint with the presentation would be the lazy background art in many scenes, hearkening to the clone-stamped look of so many generic TV anime, and some occasionally bad CG for crowd shots. All of this is made up for, though, with fantastic sound design and A-list voice acting. J.K. Simmons sounds older than Omni-Man looks for good reasons, and both perfectly nails the stern but soft-spoken fatherly persona, and eventually the madman shouting at Mark to think. THINK, MARK! The licensed music is mostly good as well, with inspired choices like using hip-hop duo Killer Mike and LP, aka Run the Jewels, for the Mahler Twins scenes. All in all, there was clearly a lot of thought in deciding what aspects of production were most important to nail if they wanted the story to click, and while the structure didn't perfectly allow for all of the story arcs to breathe and develop, it did give the central Omni-Man mystery and betrayal story exactly the attention it needed to stick in everyone's mind enough that they can't stop Think Mark thinking about it. Thanks again for listening to this cartoon analysis. You can find more of my writing on goldenwitch.substack.com where subscribers get access to bonus articles as well as podcasts where I review everything that I've looked at or done in the most recent few weeks. I also release that podcast to my $5 patrons on Patreon. You can find links to all those places in the description. Thanks again for watching. And don't forget, anime forever. Thanks for watching another Yig Studio movie. Our crew is always on the go, so we're always leading up to some kind of event.
The next place you can catch us is at the show on screen right now. So check it out if you want to see what we've got going on in person.